And I want to give you a warning before I get started. Um, I'm definitely a student on this topic. So what we're going to be talking about is creating margin. Um, I don't have this completely figured out, but you know what? I'm excited about it. I'm excited about what the future holds. I'm excited to breathe in the moments, to, what, to focus on what matters the most. And our lives are what we make of them. An axiom that we use here at Connection is what gets your attention, gets your direction, and ultimately gets your destination. I want to do this well. I want to live my life on purpose for our God who made it all. I want to live my life on purpose for the people that are all around me, my children, the next generation, my wife, my family, and my friends. And this all sounds great, right? It sounds like the way it should be. But there's something that always gets in the way. And I know that all of us have felt this, and it's hurry. So I've just I've finished this book. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's written by John Mark Comer. And then in the book, John Ortberg writes the foreword. The foreword. So John Ortberg, he's John Mark Comer's mentor. And John Ortberg's mentor was Dallas Willard. And my next read will most likely be something that is written by Dallas Willard. So in John Ortberg's foreword, he writes this. The smartest and best man I've known jotted down some thoughts about hurry. I think they were posted in his kitchen when he died. Hurry, he wrote, involves excessive haste or a state of urgency. It is associated with words such as hurl, hurdle, hurly-burly, meaning uproar, and hurricane. He defined it as a state of frantic effort one falls into in response to inadequacy, fear, and guilt. The simple essence of hurry is too much to do. The good of being delivered from hurry is not simply pleasure, but ability to do calmly and effectively with strength and joy that which really matters. We should take it as our aim, he wrote, to live our lives entirely without hurry. We should form a clear intention to live without hurry one day at a time, trying today. And that's John Ortberg. So I tried to look back on my life when hurry began for me, and I think that it started in the sixth grade. My parents gave my brother and myself the opportunity to work with them, and it was cleaning up properties that were foreclosed on. So we would go in, we'd remove all the debris, we'd get them cleaned up, mowed, weed eated, edged, sweep the driveways, the sidewalks, make sure everything was secure. We changed the locks. We'd basically get them ready for resale. And after the initial cleanup, each property would require bi-monthly mows, inspections. And what I've just told you, that's the bare minimum of what we did. There's so much more. And there are a lot of good stories that come with this too. I remember when my parents first asked us if we wanted to help them with the, with the business. And I thought that was cool. You know, that was, it was our decision. They weren't forcing us to do it. And so my brother and I, we began to dream. We thought about all the money that we could make. And we also began to dream what we would do with that money. And I remember our ultimate plan was to get motor scooters. <laughs> like, why motor scooters? But remember, I was only in the sixth grade. My brother was in the ninth grade. So neither one of us were at the age to drive. And I thought a motor scooter would be like our ticket to freedom. <laughs> it turns out it was a lot different than what we planned. We never got the motor scooters. And I, I don't know why, but I still think it'd be cool today. Probably nobody else does. But I would love to just cruise on a Vespa, you know, and listen to some music. I, d I did end up buying my first car, a 1968 Firebird, at the age of 13. So there were some good things that came out of it. It taught me how to work, taught me responsibility, how to do things right the first time. And I got to spend a lot of quality time with my parents, my brother, my sister. And in the beginning, my sister, my younger sister, she'd usually just sit in the truck and drink all of the water. And be like, dude, you don't even have to work and you drink all the water. We'd give her such a hard time. But eventually she grew out of that and she became a hard worker too. There's so many good things, but like I said earlier, that was our family's introduction to hurry. 
This would become my mom's primary job. She was a project manager, so she'd perform all the inspections. She'd do the paperwork, the initial cleans, and this was my dad's second job. So I think that he was working at the hospital at the time. He's a radiographer, and he still is today. So he performs x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs. And because of this, we would spend most of our weekends working together. And I remember being so jealous of my friends. They would just have no plans for the weekend, and I knew exactly what I was going to be doing, working. But I chose it. You know, I was given the choice. And I think what stuck out in my mind the most about this new hurry lifestyle was the amount of fast food that we would eat. Before this transition, <laughs> we would always eat at the table. And I think that is so important, and I'll come back to it later. So it started out primarily eating fast food on the weekends, but it grew more and more as I got older. We were all very busy, and I could see how the hurry changed our life or the life of our family. And there's no doubt that hurry has not been, it's not been eliminated from our lives today. It has only gotten worse. And if you were to ask the question, what is the greatest challenge to the spiritual life in Amarillo, I don't think that our initial answer would be hurry. But if you stop and think about it, you might realize that it is. So personally, for me this week, or let's just go back to last Saturday, we had Connection Men's Conference on Saturday, church on Sunday. I did some re relaxing on Sunday afternoon. The Rise Worship Night at Buff Stadium was on Tuesday, which took all day, and then we set up a little bit on Monday or got ready for it. By the way, it was amazing. There was like close to 200 people that came. The worship was awesome. It was so good. Um, I was trying, trying to read this book, you know, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry Amidst All This, and then Wednesday morning, I worked on the message. Wednesday afternoon, we put everything back from Rise, that worship night. And then at night, we had Catalyst Youth. Thursday, I was able to work on the message. Friday, I worked on the message again that morning. And then I had a date with my wife. And that's what we always try to do on Fridays. That afternoon, after getting the kiddos, we went and picked up my niece because Lindsay's sister just had her baby, her little baby boy. He's precious, by the way, little Hagen. And then our niece spent the night with us, which was, it was a lot of fun. But anyways, Saturday morning, we got up, watched Bodie play soccer. And then I went over the message again that afternoon and then spent time with my family at night. So you get the picture. I'm sure that for a lot of you, your week was just as busy or as busier. Corey Ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And there's truth in that. When I'm in a hurry, it does disrupt my connection with God. And I think about times when I even run around here like a chicken with my head cut off, you know. It's like people are going to be like, what's wrong with this dude, you know. That cuts off connection with people. And, the, and when we're in a hurry, it cuts off connection with our souls. And there's a good kind of busyness. You know, Jesus himself was very busy. The difference is we know that Jesus, his life was filled with things of value. It is when we fill our lives with too much, that's when we get into trouble. Ronald Rohauser wrote, It is not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit. We would like these. It is just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual, more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, the shopping mall, and the fantasy life they produce in us than we are in church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. We don't have to look very far to realize where this busyness and mostly distraction comes from. It's just a few feet away from us. And what is it, church? It's our phones. I remember when I got my first phone, it was a flip phone. I got right before I went my, to my freshman year in college. You know how much distraction it caused me? Zero. Man, I hated that thing. People <laughs> could now get a hold of me all the time. I was like, what is this? I didn't put my contacts in it for months. And finally, one of my friends was like, I'll just put all my contacts in your phone you know, for you. And I was like, okay, fine. This was just the beginning. 
And before we get too far into phones, I want to do a brief history lesson. This is from the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and I found it to be fascinating. Most historians point to 1370 as a turning point in, West, in the West relationship to time. That year, the first public clock tower was erected in Cologne, Germany. Before that, time was natural. It was linked to the rotation of the earth on its axis and the four seasons. You went to bed when the moon, with the moon and you got up with the sun. There was a rhythm to the day and even the year. Doesn't that sound so good? There was a rhythm to the day and even the year. Here's another fun fact. Then in 1879, you had Edison and the light bulb, which made it possible to stay up past sunset. Before the light bulb, do you know how much people slept each night? It was 10 hours, 10 hours each night. And then a dis this is a duration that recently discovered is ideal for optimal performance. Isn't that crazy? It really shouldn't be because that's how God designed it. There was a rhythm to the day. All right, so let's fast forward to our current day and age, something that definitely can cause disruption in this rhythm, the modern invention that most of us have, the smartphone. And research shows that Americans spend way too much time on their phones. The average person touches their phone 2,617 times per day. That's two and a half hours a day. And then another study on millennials put the number at twice that. A similar study found that just being in the same room as our phones, even if they're turned off, will reduce someone's working memory and problem solving. So essentially, it makes us dumber. <laughs> it's crazy. So there's no doubt about it. If we allow it, our phones, they're going to get our attention. And I see it more and more. You see a couple that's eating at a restaurant and they're both on their phones. Or you see someone who's walking down the street and they have their face planted in the phone. What gets your direction or what gets your attention gets your direction and ultimately gets your destination. So just an example, if we allow our phones to consume our attention, say on the internet, social media, email, Netflix, and the weather app, and I don't even like listing the weather app. I love checking the weather. I don't, I don't know why. It's like <laughs> something that's innate in me. So I think that checking the weather app, actually, that flows in the rhythm of my days. So anyways, if this gets our attention, I believe that it will change our direction because we become so distracted. And on top of that, we live our lives in a hurry. And that will ultimately change our destination. We have to slow down in order to hear God. And there's so much more that I can include, but I'm so ready to get to the good part. I once heard someone say that you can determine what you love by what you focus on. And at first I was like, dude, that can't be right, you know? That breaks it down way too small. But when you stop and think about it, there's truth in that. Love takes time. And this reminds me of a Jack Johnson song, and I usually sing in the youth messages, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it real quick. Slow down, everyone, you're moving too fast. Love don't come easy when you're moving like that. Okay, it's enough of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you have a relationship with anyone, it's gonna take your time. If you have a relationship with God, it's gonna take your time. And I don't even like saying that. Take your time when I'm talking about spending time with God. He gave us this life. It is a gift. Our time on this earth is a gift from God. How will we use it? So to answer this question, let's take a look at Jesus. So starting in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, and this is in the NIV version. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now let's take a look at the same verse, and this is in the message version. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. 
Isn't this beautiful? A yoke was used in the agrarian times, and it's a yoke, two yoke, two oxen together to plow a field. And every rabbi or teacher had a yoke. So it was their way of teaching the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. People had been yoked to the law of Moses and to the Pharisees. Their burdens from the Pharisees were high, and they wanted to be delivered from these burdens. And Jesus offered them and us his yoke, which is easy, and the burdens placed on us are light. And if anything, I want to work with Jesus. I want to share that yoke in how I do my life, share that yoke in my marriage, my parenting, my mentoring, my sleeping, my eating, my everyday getting around in this life. Romans 12.2 says this, and it's in the message version, place your life before God. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work and walking around in life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. To embrace what God has done for us is to embrace Jesus. To ask ourselves the question, if Jesus was living my life right now, what would it look like? He has given us the easy yoke because we can place our burdens upon him. We don't have to carry them anymore. And it's still going to be work. Don't get me wrong. Jesus also said in this world, we will have trouble. But what does he say after that? He said, but take heart because I have overcome the world. In the time of Jesus, people were overburdened by the Pharisees. They simply had too much to do. In this day and age, we still have too much to do. It's like we want to fit Jesus into our life, not Jesus become our life. And that's what I want. I want Jesus to become my life through and through. So what needs to happen? What changes need to be made? We have to create margin. So margin is unscheduled time that you can use in whatever way refreshes you, helps you get back track on life. Margin is your breathing room. It's your schedule's emergency fund. When you're running late or somebody throws up or you just need to put your feet up for a while. (laughs) I love that definition. So we have to ask ourselves, how did Jesus create margin? And like I stated earlier, Jesus was very busy. However, you see it time and time again, Jesus refreshes himself with the Father. And I've always heard this, but I didn't really get its significance until I read this book. At the end of Matthew 3, Jesus is baptized. And it's one of my favorite stories, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. It says that as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him, like a dove alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. And this marks the beginning of Jesus' ministry. But what happens immediately after that? In Matthew 4, 1-2, through it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry." I put a message together on the wilderness, it was two years ago, and what I focused on was the physical side of the story. I focused on how tough Jesus had to have been, you know, to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And can you imagine it? I I know I can't. What I really should have been focusing on is the spiritual. What I mean, of course, is it was difficult physically to go without food for that long of a time. But spiritually, however, I do believe that Jesus was in a place of strength. He had just spent 40 days and 40 nights in prayer and fasting with his father. He was prepared for whatever the tempter had for him. The devil had to have thought that he was weak. Little did the devil know he was strong. And isn't that cool? I mean, that that brings like a whole new light to the story. 
And time and time again, we read that Jesus goes to the wilderness. In the Greek, it is eremos. And it can be translated as a desert, deserted place, desolate place, solitary place, lonely place, quiet place, and or wilderness. In Mark 1, it sounds this sounds like a very long day of ministry for Jesus. He was teaching the synagogue. He healed Simon's mother-in-law in her home. In Mark, starting in 132, it says that evening after sunset, people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. And I'm sure that he was exhausted. But you know what the Bible says that he does that next day? In 35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions, they went looking for him. When they found him, they're like, everyone is looking for you. You know what I would have responded with? I'd been like, well, let's go see them, you know? But that's not how Jesus responds at all. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Jesus knew exactly what he needed to do because of his strong connection with his father. And again, in Mark 6, the apostles, they had just been sent out two by two. They were returning to him. So verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many were coming and going, they didn't even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them. They ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So what happens to Jesus? This time, he had compassion on people. Life happens in ministry. It happens to all of us. You plan a vacation and someone gets sick. You think that you have a day off, but you got to fit something else into your schedule. We do these out of compassion. And the story isn't over. So right after that, he feeds 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fish. And then it says in Mark 6:45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. So after a very long day and feeding 5,000 people, Jesus still found time to pray. And the author of the book makes a confession, and I'm on the same page. When I get busy, one of the first things to go out of my life is my prayer time. And no more will this happen. That is the most important thing that I can do in this life. We have to have that connection with God. Jesus himself, the Son of God, withdrew to quiet places often. And let me reiterate that. He was the Son of God, and he needed that time for clear direction, for clarity. How could we be any different? Find your quiet place daily. And somewhere in the book, it says our schedules must line up with our values. And I think this is where it all begins. It has to. We have to develop our schedules based upon our connection with God. And this will determine, this will determine or should determine our values. What's most valuable in our lives? And there's so many times that we live our day to day lives at our thresholds. Our thresholds would be our limits. When I reach my threshold, I, I don't act like the person I want to be, like God designed me to be. I'm short with my kids. I'm short with my wife. I'm short with the people that matter to me the most. I don't give decisions the adequate amount of time that they deserve. I've created no margin for myself. So what's margin again? Margin is unscheduled time that you can use in whatever way refreshes you or helps you get back on, get back on track with life. Margin is your breathing room. It's your schedule's emergency fund for when you're running late or somebody throws up or you just need to put your feet up for a while. Another definition says an amount of something included so as to be sure of success and safety. I don't want to dip my toes in that threshold anymore. You can put that image back up. Like so much of us put 
our feet or our toes right at that line. And the margin, the start of the margin is way back there. However, many, however, that's so many times where we live at the threshold. I want the amount of time included so as to be sure of success or safety. I had to practice creating margin this Thursday to get ready for this message. I worked on the message all day Thursday, and usually on Thursday I'd be getting the church facility ready for Sunday morning. I had to include the amount of time that was needed to make sure this message was a, su- a success. And like I said earlier, I'm a student of this. You know who gave me this idea? It was Lindsay. She knows me. She knows that I need help creating margin in my life. And that would be my side note, and it goes along with what we've already been talking about, is communication. And I'm not the best communicator. I think I started out that way as a kid. I've always listened well as a young boy. That doesn't mean that I did what I was supposed to. You know, I got in trouble so much as a kid. But I probably heard you if you got my attention. And I've acquired better communication skills as I've gotten older. And I realize the importance of also being heard, especially if you have something good to say. A lot of that comes with marriage. Communication is vital in marriage. Communication is vital in any relationship because relationships take time. So it starts with the Father. Jesus said himself, not my will, but your will be done. We take that time to communicate with the Father. That will in turn give us our best yes to decisions. And I take those best yeses and also communicate that to Lindsay. And I would not be half the man that I am today if I, if I didn't communicate with her. We cannot forget that the two are made one flesh, and that's a sacred bond. It's compared to the relationship of the church as the bride of Christ. It's sacred. That communication has to be there or it's going to fall apart. Saying yes to something is also saying no to something else. So I, could, I used to convince myself that I could do it all. You know, like whatever needed to be done, I was your guy. And a lot of times that was it at the expense of my family. Now, I eventually would have to step back and say, you know what? Let me get back to you on that. I should, prob- I should probably discuss that with my wife. And doesn't that seem like the obvious thing to do? Like I said earlier, I'm not the best communicator. So these things had to be learned by me. And I realized that if I said yes to helping someone else on their projects, a lot of times the things that I needed to get done at the house were not getting done. My yes to something was saying no to something else. Talk with the Father, figure out your best yes, and communicate that with your spouse, your loved ones, or your friends. And remember that saying yes to something else is saying no to something else. And the last point is slow down. The last change that I'm going to be making and will continue to make in my life is to slow down. There's a sweetness in thinking about slowing down with my family on a regular basis, like slowing down with them weekly. In the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he talks about taking the Sabbath back. Why did we ever give it away? Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was made for us. That is because the Lord knew that we needed it. God himself rested on the seventh day after creating the heavens and the earth. He set the day apart as holy, and I want this. And it's a little different for me because I work on Sunday. I wouldn't call Sunday all of rest, but it definitely is worship. The day is set apart, and I believe that it's holy. It's our day to... Oh, I'm sorry. Lindsay and I, we do set Friday apart, or we try to. That's our date day. It's our day to slow down with each other. It's perfect. I'm off on Friday. She is too. So while our kids are at school, it's a built-in day for us. Oftentimes, we look forward to this day. If we have a crazy week, we know that Friday is up ahead. We can spend time with each other. It's our time to check in with each other. Sometimes it's working. Sometimes it's running errands. Every time, it is either spending lunch or brunch together. Talking about the week, talking about the future, it's it's beautiful. I want to slow down like that with my heavenly 
Father, I want a day of only rest and worship that is creating margin within the week. It needs to be done with my kiddos so that they can see the importance of spending that time with our Father. Take back the Sabbath. In the Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he gives a list of ways to slow down. And I've compiled a list that I want to incorporate in my life. Some are from that list. See what works for you and make your own list to slow down. The first one is take long walks with my, with my wife. I love doing this. It reconnects me with Lindsay. It reconnects me with my soul. I love being outside. Second one is enjoying time around the table. So we often tell our highs and our lows around the table, and that changes from day to day. And I really just want to stop and breathe in these times. My kiddos are growing up so fast. Another practice that we do around the table is we check in with each kiddo, and this happens on Sunday afternoon at the table. We see where they are each week. What are the areas that they need to work on, that they feel like they need to work on? And we tell them areas that we think that they're doing great at, and we pray with them. And this has been so good to slow down with them each week. So we do it individually at a time. The third one is drive the speed limit. <laughs> this, this one is in the book, and I think it's revolutionary. Growing up, you know, fast was always better. I wanted to be the fastest kid in school. I used to do my hands like this because I felt like I could cut the air, you know? <laughs> like I was more aerodynamic. I, I think it did increase my speed. And then they taught you to do it like that. I was like, that ain't right. <laughs> but I've, I've always, I mean, even driving fast, you know, I've always driven fast. Whenever we were first married, I had to pay a fine every year because of the amount of speeding tickets, tickets I acquired. And this was at the age of only 22. <laughs> now driving the speed limit, that sounds like a pretty novel idea. Put your phone in a designated place when you get home. We have this old piece of furniture. It is called a telephone chair, and it's pretty cool. But we thought about leaving our phones there at a certain time. That way we wouldn't be distracted by it. And I don't really think I have an issue with the phone right now. I'm not saying that that was always the case. I do think it'd be more beneficial for Lindsay right now. She, well, I'm not saying that she gets on it. <laughs> I'm saying it's a distraction because her what she does for a living. I mean, it'll create that separation. She's so high stress, and she needs that separation. Next one, set a time for social media or a time limit to get off of it. I personally don't have social media. I, I just don't have time for it. Next one is walk slower. This was on the list. I thought it was, I thought it was really good. I think it'd be good for me. And I kept thinking of that old Alabama song. I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. All I really got to do is live and die. But I'm in a hurry and don't know why. I walk, f <laughs> I walk fast like all the time. When I was a kid, I used to run like from the living room to my bedroom just to see how fast I could get there. And, but that was like all the time. <laughs> slow down and have conversation with people. I think if I slow down, that would create more mindfulness in me. Don't just jump to the next thing. Have a good conversation is the last one. Like I said, I'm not the best communicator. It's a skill that I have to work on. And I'm much better at doing things and performing tasks. That would be my go-to. Now, I don't think that's what I'm always called to. If you have something good to say, people should hear it. That could bring life to someone's day, and that could bring life to your day. Creating margin is a lifelong journey. It is enjoying the journey and not just looking forward to the destination. It is doing life on purpose, breathing in the moments this gift called life. What, what will get your focus? What will get your attention that will ultimately get your destination? And our, I want our destinations to be good ones. I want them to be a compilation of the best yeses in life because we chose the narrow path that is God's will. We chose what he wanted. 
In order to do that, we must slow down. Slow down, everyone. You're moving too fast. Love don't come easy when you're moving <laughs> like that. Creating margin in our lives allows us to love others the way that God intended. It allows us to love him the way that he intended. I'm going to have the altar team come up. And uh, if you, if you want to make a change in your life, Come up here and receive prayer. If you, if, if you feel like you need to slow down, take this time. I mean, this could be a commitment to saying, hey, I plan on slowing down. I plan on slowing down this week. I plan on trying to slow down for the rest of my life. Busyness is going to happen, but choosing our best yeses, that's what, that's what I want to do. And this week, as far as just thinking about this, thinking about slowing down, enjoying the moments, it's, it's been so good. It's something, I think it kind of reconnected my soul this week. So I know that's what the Lord wants for us. He wants us to connect with him. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the way that you love us, Father. The way that you want to connect with us, Lord. I pray that we would take the time, we take the time to connect with you each day, that we'd realize what the best yeses are in our life, that we would slow down, Father. Lord, and we simply have too much to do. And I pray that we would take the easy yoke and live our life like Jesus, not try to fit Jesus in our life. Lord, we love you so much and praise you. And I pray today would be a day of rest and worship. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.